little cheddar box, the one with pretty auburn locks. Whom do you see? It's little orphan Annie. She and Sandy make a pair. They never seem to have a care. Cute little sheep, this little orphan Annie. Bright eyes, cheeks of rosy glow, there's a store of healthiness handy. Might size, always on the go, if you want to know. Heart says Sandy, always wears a sunny smile. Now wouldn't it be worth a while, if you could be like little orphan Annie. Here it is, 5.45 now, Orphan Annie time and Ovaltine time again. And now, if you're one of Annie's new radio friends who have just started to listen to her adventures lately, I want to ask you, have you tried Ovaltine yet? Well, if you haven't, you certainly want to ask your mother to get you some right away, because if you think it's fun listening to Orphan Annie, you just try drinking Ovaltine. See how much fun that is. Talk about good... Why, it's even better than having a chocolate soda right in your own home whenever you want it. But that's only half of it. Ovaltine not only tastes good, but it's good for you, too. Every single glassful you drink gives you important strength and energy-building food elements to help make you husky and healthy like Orphan Annie herself. And isn't that the way you want to be? Well, remember, drinking your Ovaltine is one of the surest ways to help. So ask your mother to get you a can of Ovaltine at her drug or grocery store right now so you can have a big delicious glass full with your dinner tonight and with all your meals every day from now on. But now, for our story. You remember, lots of mysterious things have been happening around Simmons Corner this summer ever since those two strange men came to live in the old Gregory barn near the silos. And right now, Orphan Annie and Joe Corntassel know the answer to a big secret that's kept the whole town guessing. They know those two strangers are Bob Bond and Professor Adolph Washington Kenyon, and that they're inventing a secret new silent airplane for the United States government. And Annie and Joe are the only ones who know about it because Bob Bond made them promise to keep it secret. But then, just lately, a mysterious foreigner, Mr. Nicholson, came to Simmons Corners. Bob Bond says he's a spy from a foreign government trying to steal the plans of our new plane. And then Annie and Joe found out that Mr. Nicholson keeps guns in his house. And the next thing we knew, we heard that Nicholson is suspected of poisoning Bob Bond's watchdog, Blood. But let's see what Annie's doing now. Last time, Bond was telling Annie and Joe the story of the Wright brothers and the invention of the first airplane. And here it is the next day. And we find Annie and Joe just out of school, racing each other for the Gregory Barn to hear the rest of that story. And listen, Joe's talking. Come on, Annie. I'm going to beat you. Is that so? You better so. Unless you get the lead out of your feet in an awful hurry. Don't you worry about the lead in my feet, Joe. We've been running a long ways. I've just been saving myself. Well, there's no need in saving yourself any longer. We're almost there. Yeah. And I'm coming. Gosh. I thought you were all in, Annie. No, sir. In a long race, it's the one who goes easy at the start who's most likely to win. Shucks, uh, I guess it is. Wait a minute, Annie. Slow down. Slow down. <laughs> All right, Joe. Next time, remember on a long race, not to wear yourself out at the start. You you bet I will. Wait a minute, Joe. Slow down. That's blood bark. It sure is. And here he comes. We don't want to be running like this. He might get excited and not know us. Stop, Joe. Stop. All right. Here, blood. Here, blood. Feet and lizards is just us, blood. You know Annie and Joe. Shucks, I'll say he knows us. Look at him wag his tail. Gosh, I'll bet we're just about the only people in Simmons Corners who can come up to like this without getting bitten. I wouldn't wonder, Joe. Blood's a mighty good watchdog. Aren't you, old boy? Well, I'll say he is. He keeps Professor Kenyon's plane in that barn just about as secret as anything could keep it. Yeah, and he will keep it secret, too, if folks let him, won't you, Blood? What do you mean, Annie? Well, you're not forgetting what Mr. Bond said about somebody trying to poison the dog, are you, Joe? Gosh, I was forgetting it. Of all the dirty tricks, the worst is to harm a poor dog. It sure is, Joe. But I guess that man Nicholson wouldn't stop at anything to get what he wanted. He's mighty smooth, well, and there I... there you are. Well, I wondered what Blood was barking about. Hello, Mr. Bond. Come on over. We're coming. You bet. 
Come on, Annie. Don't worry, I won't be behind. Well, somehow I thought you'd both be over this afternoon. Suffering sunfish, Mr. Bond, you knew we would. Didn't you promise to go on telling us about the Wright brothers? I do remember saying something like that. Come in, come in. Glad you stay out there and keep watch, understand? <laughs> Good dog. Come in and I'll shut the door. <laughs> so, you remembered about the Wright brothers, eh? Did we? Shoves all during my geography lesson today. I was seeing airplanes flying across my map of the United States. And that's exactly what airplanes are doing, Joe. Flying across the map of the United States at all hours, day and night in all directions, carrying the mail and uniting our whole country in a network of airlines, just as it's already united by a series of railroads. Gosh, I never looked at aviation like that before. That's what it amounts to now. A great new method of transportation, faster than the wind that is becoming safer day by day as radio guide beacons and rays are perfected and landing fields spread across the country. And all because 36 years ago, back in 1900, Wilbur and Orville Wright, two American brothers, started their first experiments with the airplane. God, well, tell us about it, Mr. Bond. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's get a little more comfortable if I'm going to tell you the whole story of the Wright brothers. Professor Kenyon's working in the next room, but... Well, we can go through this door to where the plane is and sit on that old workbench of ours. Come on. Did anybody try to hurt blood last night, Mr. Bond? No. Nothing at all last night, Annie. Just that one dose of poison of which you didn't eat enough of to kill him. I guess Nicholson's laying back and waiting. Ah, here we are. Hop up. Get comfortable. I'll just light this old pipe of mine. There. Hmm. That's good. Now then, what do you want to know? Shucks, all about the Wright brothers, Mr. Bond. <laughs> well, that's a pretty big order, Joe. Because there's a lot about the Wright brothers. They were remarkable men. You got yesterday, Mr. Bond, to where their father uh, brought them a little model airplane. Oh, yes, yes. Well, that toy, that little model airplane, set those two boys, Wilbur and Orville Wright, off on their great invention. I've always thought that parents who gave their children mechanical toys might be helping them greatly in their futures. Well, anyhow, the two Wright boys became interested in aviation from that moment. But they had their livings to make. So they made bicycles to make those livings. What happened? <laughs> they spent a lot of money, Annie. All they made, in fact. But they weren't discouraged by their failures. No, sir. They picked a place on the Carolina sand flats by the Atlantic Ocean, a place called Kill Devil Hill, four miles south of Kitty Hawk, for their first experiments in gliding. Gliding? Oh, yes, yes. The Wrights were two good scientists to try to walk before they learned how to crawl. They wanted to know all there was to know about the air before they tried to fly in it. So for a whole year, they sent up different kinds of kites and experimented with them, learning everything they could. Then, the next year, 1901, they tried gliders, planes built to carry a man merely on the current of the wind and without power. It was during these experiments that they learned how to curve the surface of their planes so they would sustain them better in the air. And then what happened? Well, then, after three years of experimenting, they were ready for the great test. They built a plane with a motor in it and propeller, a power plane a plane they hoped would be able to lift a man from the ground with its own force. And did it? Oh, <laughs> not so fast, Joe. The Wright brothers weren't in such a hurry. Remember, they spent three years before they even got to this power plane. And a queer sort of plane it was, judged by the planes of today. A biplane. That means it had two planes, one built over the other. And there was no place for the operator to sit. He had to lie on a sort of a platform flat on his face. Gosh! But the Wright brothers built it carefully and by themselves and then took it to pieces to Kitty Hawk where they assembled it. Now Kitty Hawk with its sand dunes is a lonesome place. There's nothing but sand and the sea there. Sand and the sea and the sky and a wind that always blows. But there on those lonesome sand dunes Orville Wright son of an American minister, was the first man in the whole world who ever soared into the air in a plane powered by a motor. Leaping lizards! He actually did it, Mr. Bond? Yes, he actually did it, Annie. 
on a cold, wind-blown day, the 17th of December, 1903. Only five people besides his brother Wilbur saw the flight, and these were mostly Coast Guards from the Atlantic. But the plane did soar into the air, though it only stayed in the air for 12 seconds. But history had been made. History that was and is to change man's whole means of transportation. For on that December day, 33 years ago, man first succeeded in conquering the air in a machine that lifted itself with its own power. Gosh, that's pretty wonderful. Wonderful? Why? <clears throat> Joe, it's the greatest thing that's happened on this earth in the last hundred years. Mmm, that little flight of Orville Wright's at Kitty Hawk. It meant that man had conquered the last element, the air. It's pretty exciting, all right. What happened after that, Mr. Vaughn? Well, after that first flight, the Wright brothers listen, would... Listen to what, Joe? Don't you hear? Isn't that blood barking? Say, that is blood. Wait till I have a look out this window. Well, what's up, Mr. Vaughn? I don't know. I can't see anything yet. Boy, he's sure barking at somebody. Just listen to him. Lizards, what's happened? That was a gun. Somebody shot Blood. Come on. Gosh, come on, Annie. You bet I'm coming. If anybody's killed Blood, I'll... Yes, I'll... he's not killed. Listen to him now. Hurry, Mr. Bond. Oh, this lock stuck. It's stuck. It... Ah, there it is. Here, Blood. Here, Blood. Joe, look. Over there, just going into the woods. I don't see anything, Annie. Well, I did. Well, good old Blood. What's the matter, boy? What is it? He's suffering selfish, Mr. Bond. He has been shot. Look at his front leg there. Let me see, boy. Let me see. Now, I'm not going to hurt you. Hmm. That's a bullet wound, all right. Lucky it didn't hit the bone. It went through the flesh and muscles here. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you, blood. Sore, eh? Well, we'll get you fixed up in no time at all. Though I guess you'll have to stay inside for a while. What a mean trick to shoot a dog. It is, and if I get my hands on the man that did it, I... I... saw the man, Mr. Bond. You did, Annie? When? Where? Just as we ran out of the door. I happened to look off there towards the woods, and I saw a man just disappearing into those red sumac bushes. Who was it, Annie? That's just it. I can't say for sure. I'm not positive. I didn't get a good enough look. But he sure looked like just one man, and that's Nicholson. Well, what do you know about that? Blood has been shot, and the man who shot him looks like Nicholson. Only Annie can't say for certain because she didn't get a good enough look to be sure it was Nicholson. But someone is certainly trying to get rid of Bob Bond's watchdog. What do you suppose he'll try to do next? And by the way, have you ever noticed that whenever there's something exciting to be done, it seems there's just nothing that can stop our Annie? And I guess that's why so many boys and girls want to know how they can be like Annie, peppy and healthy, and ready for whatever fun's popping around them. Well, now, here's a tip. One of the very best ways to start is to drink Ovaltine every single day, with meals and in between meals, too. All those important minerals and vitamins and things contained in every glassful of keen-tasting Ovaltine may help to give you real Orphan Annie pep. And when you have that, you feel so good and have so much extra energy, you can be ready for almost anything that comes along, just as our Annie always is. And so you really ought to ask your mother to get you a can of Ovaltine at her drug or grocery store right away so you can start right in with a big delicious glass full for supper this very night. And you certainly want to be here right on the dot tomorrow at Orphan Annie time to see if Annie can find out who shot Bob Bond's dog. Until tomorrow at the same time, then, goodbye.